I'm Barclay Poling, Small Fruit Specialist, NC State, Department of Horticultural Science, and I'm out here today with Andy Myers, who is the uh, manager over all the different crops here at the Piedmont Research Station in Salisbury. And it's just about noontime, and we're standing out in front of our uh, strawberry tunnel structure. Uh, we've been harvesting strawberries, if you can believe it, for the last two months, and today is about the third week of January. Eighteen weeks, actually. 18 weeks, so we're, we're really excited about this project. It's a research project, but we thought we'd uh, share with the viewers at this website some of the developments taking place with the strawberry tunnel research. Andy, let's, let's head on in there and take a look at the crop right. and, and uh, see how we're doing. Sure. Andy, this is a shock to see how well we came through last week's freeze. Yeah, uh, I, was, I was really surprised. So I'm excited that we're actually looking at picking a crop here uh, and survived a temperature that was below last year's. Mm -hmm. I think we recorded five degrees just outside the tunnel That's last correct. Saturday morning. Yeah. So that was mighty chilly. Uh, strawberries can't tolerate temperatures much below mid-20s, let alone five degrees. So we did a lot of cold protection in here, and we're going to be going through today looking at how our different approaches to that cold protection uh, worked out. But I just thought I'd say a few words, Andy, about the, the site here, seeing some nice live blossoms is pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. Here, less than a week away from that freeze event, the plants have already bounced back with lots of yeah, really have. pretty blooms, and um, mm -hmm. that means another 30 days we'll have some red ripe berries like these here. We're going to talk about uh, what we did in here in this particular tunnel. Uh, we had a two ounce, what we call a two ounce row cover. And what that means is every square yard of row cover weighs two ounces. And we have one of these cloths right here. It's, it's rolled up today into the middle of the house. And this is, it looks like a, um, a, a fabric of some type. It's, they call it a non-woven in the textile world. It's a non-woven. Uh, and it's a spun bonded product and uh, it comes in, in a variety of sizes, lengths and widths. Uh, we have it set here for about 160 feet in length and uh, it covers the full width of this house which is about 26 feet wide. Uh, so a square yard of this product is going to weigh two ounces. Uh, there are lighter weight covers but we felt for the type of freeze that we were up against recently, we needed a, a good uh, uh, thermal cover. And with this, we got way more than we anticipated in terms of protection. In fact, outside when it was five degrees, we stayed in this house above 30 the entire night. And the way we did that uh, was to actually suspend another cover above the cover that was blanketed over the crop itself. We raised up a second cover and put it approximately a foot above the uh, strawberry canopy. And we had what we had call a dead air space in between, and this gave us some very nice insulation properties so that that particular treatment, we noted, was staying, keeping the strawberry blossoms down beneath uh, uh, at 35 degrees or above the entire night. And we thought the two ounce might give us eight degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees protection, but it actually went well beyond that. Yes, it did. And we've just discovered through this research at the Piedmont Research Station here in Salisbury that these row covers under certain environmental conditions are giving us well over 20 degrees Fahrenheit protection. A second approach that we took to protecting the crop from a deep freeze was to irrigate on top of the beds. We first pulled the entire row cover over the plants, just the single two ounce cover, and then Andy, wasn't it about 30 degrees, I believe, when we got to a temperature of 30 degrees that night in the blossom. Right, bloom temperature, yes. Which was about 2 in the morning. I remember I, I came back I and it was about 2.30 in the morning, mm -hmm. and that was when you started the water up. Right, inside and, the uh, tunnel. Yeah. And Andy, we've got a wobbler system here. Mm -hmm. What yes. are kind of some rough dimensions? We have them about how far apart? Uh, we, we have them spaced 15 feet apart, and uh, these particular wobblers will throw it Probably 12 feet, 12 and a half feet uh, each side of the of the center of the house here. So it worked out really good that we could keep all the water in this one tunnel and, and uh, get this good information. I guess our concern was with the keep keep spinning all night. Right. Yeah. We we I was worried about that because as you know the 
a lot of times when you're overhead frost protection or freeze protecting mm -hmm. outside with irrigation, those nozzles will freeze yeah. up and you have to knock ice off and whatnot. Uh, these made it really well all through the night. About 8 o'clock in the morning, there was we saw two of them that were starting to, to not function properly. Yeah. That We had icicles hanging off of them about a foot long, but uh, I guess just the spinning, wobbling action mm -hmm. of it kept it kept it free enough that it worked really well. I was surprised. And seasoned strawberry growers who use overhead sprinkling for frost protection, of course, know the reason we do that is as soon as the liquid water freezes up and reaches that solid state, there's a little burst of energy or heat that is released. It's called the latent heat of fusion. And it seems sort of uh, counterintuitive that on a night freezing cold like it was, you would be sprinkling water to warm things up. And a lot of people think you're doing it just to put an ice layer out there. That's not the case. You're doing it to capture the energy release from the liquid to the frozen state. And that's the secret to overhead irrigation. Just for curiosity's sake, we also planted some of the same varieties, same date, black plastic mulch, just beyond the tunnel structure. And these are plants that just went through an episode in the single digits, five degrees. And you can see a lot of leaf damage here. Uh, there are absolutely no blossoms that survive. Uh, they're what we call toast. <laughs> And um, I'll peel one or two away here, but you can see it just was completely um, killed back by that freeze the other night. It'll be weeks, if not months, before these recover. Uh, that's not a problem if you're a traditional plasticulture grower. This is kind of how your crop looks at this time of year. But I thought you'd like to see the, the major difference in the appearance of the plants, and certainly we don't see any evidence of live blooms or fruits out here locally grown strawberries right here in North Carolina in the middle of the winter. Mm -hmm. And better yet, we can have those berries uh, in markets continuously, it looks like to me, from late fall until the, uh, until the spring crop.